Hello and welcome to Chain Reaction, a new podcast series examining America's role in the world. I am your host, Aaron Stein, Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. Every two weeks, we'll talk to experts about a variety of topics and why it matters for U.S. foreign policy. On this episode of Chain Reaction, we discuss great power competition, how it was conceived in the Trump administration, and how the Biden administration is continuing with this policy in its early days. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome. Today I'm talking to Dr. Thomas Lynch, a distinguished research fellow at the Institute of National Strategic Studies of the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Uh, Thomas, it's good to have you on the show. Hey, great, Aaron. Nice to be with you today. Yeah, and uh, for listeners, this has been a long time in the making. Uh, this was a difficult podcast to schedule, largely because of um, the coronavirus. So thanks for putting up with me. No problem. Well, the reason I wanted to talk to you, or the reason that we, we got put together, is that you know a longtime friend of FPRI, uh, Frank Hoffman, who I, I know that you collaborated with quite closely on your new edited volume, which just came out with ND, NDU, which is, uh, the title is... Uh, that you, I guess you were the editor of, Strategic Assessment 2020 into a New Era of Great Power Competition, uh, which is sitting upstairs. I left it in my daughter's room, but it, it's quite a comprehensive look. And I think one of the first about this new era of great power competition. Uh, for, I mean, just everybody, I think it would be useful to dive first into just how this this concept came about and, and really how it drove the uh, national defense strategy uh, during, the t- during the sort of the middle period of the Trump administration. Yeah, great, Aaron. Very happy to do so. And thanks so much again for making time for this. I'm delighted to be here with you and your FPRI audience. You know, as you mentioned, uh, my, my colleague, Frank Hoffman, a uh, longtime member and uh, participant with FPRI and, and indeed also the Orbis Journal. And I've had the good fortune over the years of interacting with FPRI uh, and publishing in Orbis, uh, nothing since about 2015. So great to get you know back uh, with and on the program here and uh, to have a chance to talk to you and your audience. Let me say, if I might, that as I start my comments, everything I say here represent the results of my own research and work uh, as published uh, in the, the, the book you mentioned uh, into a new era of great power competition. Uh, and they do not necessarily represent the views of my home institution, the National Defense University, the U.S. government, or the Department of Defense. So just wanted to you know, get that out there before having the conversation. But as you said, uh, the project we undertook here, the edited volume, Strategic Assessment 2020, into a new era of great power competition, which I should mention is available for free uh, on either the uh, National Defense University press website, which is where we publish this, or on the National Defense University Institute for National Strategic Studies website. Uh, And uh, that publication uh, really was conceived and launched, uh, you know, back in early 2019 for the research, uh, because as you mentioned, we had had kind of a paradigm change in uh, the American approach to thinking about national security strategy uh, in the modern era. Uh, That paradigm change, uh, as we highlight in the book, you know, really uh, kind of uh, became formalized by way of two American strategic documents. The first was the uh, December 2017 national security strategy, the first one put out by the Trump administration, uh, which I think some in your audience will know uh, was kind of overseen by then national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, then a Lieutenant General, uh, and by uh, uh, Nadia Shadlau who was the uh, director uh, for the, the project of national security studies. And then that document was followed about uh, five months later uh, by the national defense strategy. And what those documents both did was really kind of, you know, uh, reframe America's uh, foreign policy focus and its national security focus on the competition with two primary great power rivals, China, Uh, and Russia. And so what we attempted to do here by way of this 16 chapter book was look at the different dimensions to include definitional and historical dimensions of what great power competition means, uh, what it meant, and and how it was that the discussion of great power competition, uh, you know, had been absent in a lot of, you know, thinking, uh, strategic and foreign policy thinking for quite a while, and why it had become resonant again, uh, resonant to the point of being formalized in the U.S. national security strategy and the U.S. national defense strategy. And uh, 
uh, one of the insights, kind of the historical insights that we we came up with, Aaron, uh, and that we you know worked into several of the chapters, is this notion that you know when one looks at the sweep of you know global politics uh, at the end of World War II and then going through the Trump administration. You really had structurally uh, three discrete eras. Uh, the first, of course, is the one that many of us are aware of, the Cold War era, where there was a bipolar competition between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, with other uh, states, you know, either bandwagoning or balancing against those two states. Uh, that paradigm, that structure, you know, really came crashing down with the uh, end of the Cold War and the Soviet Union's dissolution there between. Uh, 1989 and 1991. And so then from 1992, and uh, in our research, we kind of, you know, flagged up um, kind of, you know, two ramps, if you will, in terms of uh, that period from 1992 to 2017. The first ramp was, you know, unassailable American dominance, American unipolarity, and a framework where pretty much everybody who was anybody, with the exception of the global terrorist threat, was working towards cooperation and collaboration in the international sphere. By the time you get to about 2008 or 9, there are cracks or fissures in that. It starts to become clear that Russia under Putin and increasingly uh, China under its Communist Party uh, are, are looking at the United States ascendance and, and finding it to be lacking in many ways, finding uh, there to be differences and significant divergences in about the way each of those countries saw the future. And more importantly, perhaps, there was a, a rising uh, relative power dimension to each of those countries that was starting to push what had been unassailable American power from 1992 to about the end of the 2000s, uh, you know, into the play. And so, as we identify in the book, Aaron, we, we kind of, you know, would establish a 2008-2009 framework as the arrival of a de facto a period of great power competition. And this time, though, not a bipolar competition as had been during the Cold War, but rather a competition between three great states, each of whom had unique capabilities, each of whom wished to have those capabilities matter globally, and each of whom was be increasingly being paid attention to uh, by all the other states in the world when they were trying to make decisions on their foreign policy. And that de facto period of great power competition, which in many ways, as we identify in the book, was, was not acknowledged yet in U.S policy. Indeed, some of your listeners, uh, as you will probably remember, the effort to uh, reset U.S.-Russian relations with a reset button by then Secretary of State Clinton, uh, and uh, also, you know, efforts by President Obama uh, in 2013 and 14 to have summit meetings with the Chinese to try to explain to them our concerns that they weren't behaving as responsible global stakeholders, uh, and in an effort to get them to, you know, stop doing things like industrial espionage, um, other types of things that we found threatening to the global order we wish to pursue and they wish to pursue. Um, none of which really produce the kind of uh, return to collaborative results that we would want. And so that interim period of de facto great power competition, roughly from 2009 through about 2017, you know, we identify was ended basically, uh, you know, by the formal documentation in the U.S. national security strategy and the U.S. defense uh, strategy uh, as a formal acknowledgement of great power competition and kind of where we are today. So, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is I think that when we talk about great power competition is that there's this knee-jerk callback to the Cold War. And you touched on it briefly, you know, um, in the answer you just gave, which is, you know, we've moved from this area of bipolarity to, to multipolarity. But I think a lot of our assumptions may at least, you know, sort of in, outside in the policy space may be informed by what we think happened in the Cold War. Can you expand upon that a little bit to how this differs from the Cold War and, and the U.S. and USSR standoff and to how this is perhaps more complicated than those um, – you know, the period between basically 1947 and 1991? Yeah, excellent, Aaron. I think I think that is, you know, absolutely one of the key uh, points uh, to to consider and, and that I would encourage your, your listeners to consider here is, you know, quite often 
we want to go back and find something comfortable in history as a touch point and sometimes can be, uh, you know, a, a little too uncritical in trying to, you know, assess the factors of then versus now. And this is a very different period. I mean, even though a lot of authors' works, uh, opinion pieces, short editorials over the last couple of years have hearkened back to this notion of a Cold War with China, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we identify in the book, and particularly I do in, in the authored conclusion, several things that put up warning signs and cautions about, you know, resorting to those kinds of uh, metaphors. Uh, but at the same time, there's something about about a competitive mindset that was present in the Cold War that I think is worth uh, us continuing on with. And so let me just mention those differences, if I could, uh, you know, very briefly here and then talk about the mindset afterwards. First, as I already alluded to, um, the Cold War was distinctly a period where the structure of international politics and security was about the two, the US and the USSR. And the dynamics of the two are very different in terms of what the other states in the system have in terms of alternatives. They generally have to decide kind of an either or, pick a side. Now, clearly there was a non-aligned movement. There were efforts by countries such as uh, India and to a lesser degree China to have a non-aligned movement in the period of the bipolar Cold War. But in generally states balanced or bandwagoned either with or against the states of the, the uh, Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, that's different than when you have three states jousting for position and, and activities. That gives other, other states that are you know, less powerful but no less important in the system different options and choices. It's not just about uh, black or white, one side or the other. It's um, you know, maybe you know, sidle up to Russia in certain areas, maybe uh, align with China in other areas maybe keep the United States on side in other areas. So there's a very different set of, of choices and positions that, that can go on there. Next, there's the very issue of the great states themselves, whereas a state like the United States and the Soviet Union and the bipolar Cold War, you know, had no, you know, constraints other than what the other might do. Uh, in a multipolar system, in this case with three, they have to consider what two other states might do and how those states might band wagon or work together in certain areas or not work together in other areas. So that was a very different frame of reference. The second very different frame of reference here is really how each of those periods began. So the Cold War began after World War II, where basically that war had laid waste or ruin to almost all societies across and around the globe, with the notable exceptions of the United States uh, and with the exception of uh, the resurgent, rejuvenated Soviet Union, which had at the end of that war period uh, occupied a vast amount of territory, was actively in the process of excavating and moving into the Soviet Union uh, entire industrial frameworks from Europe that weren't totally destroyed to help rebuild a society. And that, uh, you know, basically was able to establish, you know, dominance uh, economically, militarily, on a level with the United States that no one else could rival. What happened quickly after that, though, is um, the very limited linkages that exist between the Soviets and the Americans in things like economy or military during World War II, they were abruptly and pretty vigorously cut off. So there was no kind of interacting or intermixing in, in the economic or the military sphere, you know, after about 1947-48. Indeed, there was actually a standoff uh, you know, over political differences in Europe, uh, starting in Greece, but then continuing with elections in Western Europe, where the United States was opposed vigorously to what the Soviets were trying to do there in terms of, you know, trying to convert or co-opt uh, governments to be more sympathetic to the Soviet Union. So that, that lack of connectivity, which then continued throughout the Cold War between the two societies, only towards the very end being eroded or chipped away, and particularly the lack of connectivity economically, is a stark contrast to where we stand today. Indeed, the three great powers now have uh, 30 to 40 years almost of interactions, deeply connected, interwoven interactions, economically, financially, uh, fiscally, and in other areas. And so the, the processes that one must follow right now 
to compete uh, with the other great powers uh, are very, very different than what the Soviets and the United States faced in the Cold War. Indeed, in one sense, you had no real basic interaction or integration. And then now we have an enormous amount of integration interaction. And so decoupling from that or disentangling from that is a very different prospect than was during the Cold War. The third thing that's worth mentioning about the Cold War as well is the, the, the notion of promulgation of ideologies. And, and here is where I think, you know, we need to be very careful about applying Cold War um, frameworks to what's going on today. Indeed, if one looks at the Cold War, it was pretty clear and obvious early on that this was going to be a um, ideological competition and even a clash between two very divergent systems and two systems that wish to promulgate their view internationally. On the Soviet side, it was through the direction not only from Moscow, but also this thing called the common turn or the second common turn, which was a collective interactive body that was actively advocating for change in government structures, for changes in management of economics, for ways of exchange of military equipment, all to make the rest of the world come on side look like, act like, walk like, talk like, more like the Soviet Union. And the United States pretty much by the 50s and 60s was reciprocating in kind. We were exporting our model, we were talking about our democracies, and we were trying to organize an international system that provided alternative views. When one looks at today, and particularly when one looks at the, the Soviet Union and looks at the uh, Chinese, you don't see anything similar in terms of those ideological or political structures. I mean, yes, both of those countries are authoritarian. Uh, some would argue uh, even totalitarian in the case of the Chinese Communist Party. But there is no kind of uh, innate organization of ideology or politics or, or aspiration, no aggressive pushing of a cohesive agenda on the part of the Chinese. And then when it looks at the Russians right now, the Russian mindset and mantra seems to be a lot more of just denigrating, chipping away at, or pushing back on an international system, blaming the United States for the global problems that exist and saying, you know, we don't like the United States, we don't like the United States led order, uh, but we've got nothing else to substitute for it. And so those are very different frames of reference and they influence how states compete today in a very different manner than the very uh, extreme and focused ideological and exporting of ideological values and systems um, during the Cold War. And, and finally, I think when one looks particularly at the US-Chinese interrelationship, it's important to note another difference from the Cold War. And, and this gets to the point about the multipolar world right now that we make throughout the book. And that is invariably multipolar worlds uh, have situations where there is a relative rising power that gets pitted against the standing dominant or ascendant power. And in this current world, uh, that, that dyad, if you will, that rivalrous dyad between a rising relative power and one that's at the top and is worried about relative decline is the Chinese and the United States. When you look at the Cold War, we did not have that dynamic. Both the Soviet Union and the United States pretty much thought they were the top of the world. And they were just trying to anchor that status, make sure that status accrued, and therefore their competition with each other wasn't about a rise and a, and a direct threat to, you know, toppling and rising through a system that already existed. Instead, it was competition uh, between two very isolated and detached systems that were fronted by the very top. Uh, again, all these kind of four components make what we're facing today very, very different and, and not metaphorically correct to align with the bipolar world. Now, the last point I wanted to make, though, at this juncture, Aaron, is that there is, however, some relevance to what scholars are calling and we write in the book about, which is a competitive mindset. And here, what the bipolar world actually did during the Cold War was I think it attuned and sensitized 
particularly Americans, but also the Western world, about the fact that international relations were not just about collaboration and cooperation, that there was this notion of that there are things worth defending, things worth protecting, certain economic things that we as states have to not just leave to the international marketplace to decide who supplies, who demands, you know, who uses, who doesn't use, who sets the rules, but that there has to be this kind of, you know, competitive framework where governments intervene, not willy-nilly, but necessarily in the capitalist marketplace to assure things like national security, uh, fundamental human freedoms, and other things are protected from the vicissitudes of international market space and market play where different values are enacted. And so I think that kind of competitive mindset one that's largely been absent in America uh, since the uh, end of the Cold War. And indeed, where one could argue that, you know, the United States government had backed more and more out of, you know, the fundamental things of industrialization and innovation and, you know, high tech, leaving it all to the commercial center. Um, that that's an area where the United States needs to become more competitive in terms of how it's thinking. And it needs to think more like it did during the Cold War, not about willy nilly engagement and markets and economics, but selective engagements to induce and encourage certain fundamental technologies for security and also for the protection of human rights. And we can think of a number of examples in the Cold War where the United States government did that, whether it be, you know, the space program, uh, or whether it be, you know, the investment in this thing, this weird thing called the internet uh, that, you know, uh, Department of Defense researchers first started in the 60s and then grew from there. And we can label a lot of others. But I think that mindset is a relevant uh, comparison, if you will, Aaron, to the bipolar cold world era where the United States may have lost a competitive edge and needs to rethink that now. Uh, what's not true is that we have all these other features of the cold war uh, that I mentioned earlier, because those really don't accrue today in this multipolar three great power era of competition. And I, I think one of the things to, you know, to, to sort of wrap this together is that one of the things that we're seeing here is I would say that it, it's not a political statement or a, or an overstatement to say that there are vast ideological differences both in policy and practice between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. But but I do think that the you know, that the two sides, or at least the two you know, political sides here in the U.S., do fundamentally agree on many of the tenets that you see in the 2018 National Defense Strategy. Uh, and yes, the Biden administration is trying to put their own stamp on it, but I would say it still remains the guiding principle. Can you talk about, you know, basically from where we were at in 2017, 2018 to where we are now? And yes, it's relatively new in the Biden administration, but it's quite clear that competition is driving elements of their foreign policy. Yeah, that is an absolutely excellent um, observation, Aaron. And, and it's one that, uh, that that we set out and make uh, in in the book, and that, that I currently you know work on trying to extend and expand here into the uh, you know era of the Biden administration as it's now framing and shaping up. I think important is just to kind of go back before the Trump administration and recognize, as I alluded to earlier, that there was this this emergent period of of what we've labeled in the book and I use in my lectures uh, de facto great power competition. And there was a recognition, uh, particularly by U.S. policymakers in the Obama administration, that something wasn't quite right. Right. We kept talking about um, engaging uh, and collaborating and cooperating, particularly with the Chinese uh, and particularly on such things as global economics and energy and climate change and, and, and of, of being more aligned with uh, international norms on exchange of goods and services and, and not being involved in espionage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this was going on you know, between about 2010 and about the end of the administration in 2016. 16, um, but there was no traction with the Chinese. Yet there was a great reluctance, I think understandable, on the part of the people in the Obama administration um, to, to not want to uh, cut into that boil, cut into that frustration, and openly, openly label the Chinese as a global competitor, much less a global rival. You know, we came close to that with a few statements by the Obama administration at the end of 2016, but we really weren't quite there. So then we transition to the Trump administration. And, and I think it's quite correct to point out 
that the Trump administration took that step. Uh, they articulated and, and like I said earlier, formalized this notion that yes, we are in an era of great power competition. And they cited that as a fact of the global environment. They cited that as a, as a structure of how US foreign policy and security strategy needed to be framed and moved forward. Um, and then they set about to uh, address that in kind of the, the Trump administration's particular way, um, which, you know, turned out to be kind of an America first paradigm, you know, was was much more, you know, bilateral in terms of challenging the Chinese directly, not so much the Russians, but challenging the Chinese directly, uh, you know, a trade war between 2018 and the end of 2019, um, some more overt and challenging statements. Um, and, and so, you know, they characterized the environment as great power competition, but then moved in the direction of, you know, uh, you know, America apart kind of an America not not so much involved in trying to, you know, bring its alliances and its structures into the process of uh, competing uh, with the Chinese. And that lead, leads us to the Biden administration. And yes, as you indicated, I mean, there, there, there was some realistic, you know, doubt, uh, you know, in, in the minds of a lot of, you know, analysts as to whether or not the Biden administration would, would want to return more towards, you know, what was the Obama administration's premise about trying to find ways to collaborate and cooperate, and maybe being resistant to even the terminology of competition or great power competition. But I think what we've seen here, particularly in a couple of the key players that have been put at the top of the policy and security apparatus in the Biden administration. And I'm thinking here of Secretary of State Blinken uh, and National Security uh, Council uh, Director and National Security Advisor um, Sullivan. Um, you, you have seasoned, experienced veteran political operatives uh, in previous Democrat administrations that have come out even before confirmed their positions. And now, especially since, they're doing two things, I think. One is... They're, they're validating the fact that the diagnosis of the Trump administration, the 2017 and 2018 documents, was, was largely correct, that we are in an era of great power competition, that there is no going back to trying to reframe or reshape this as, as you know, largely collaborative or largely cooperative. It is largely competitive, and it's likely to stay that way. The second part, though, is how they differ in terms of how they're going to pursue that competition. You know, uh, first, while they're saying that they wish to lead this uh, competition from a position of strength, um, they're also highlighting the fact that they wish to lead with diplomacy uh, backed by a strong military. And, and, and that is a, a bit different characteristic than I think we saw in the Trump administration. Moreover, as Secretary Blinken and uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan have both written before coming into office and now are saying in their public statements, when it comes to China, their focus is on, quote, competing with China when we should. That's the first thing. Second, collaborating when we can. And that's kind of the thing of saying, you know, when it comes to environment, maybe, or certain types of economic interaction or things, we are still willing to collaborate when we can. And then also the third part, which is to confront China when we must. Uh, and I think those are, you know, important divergences and differences from the manner in which both the Obama administration approached our relationship and even how the Trump administration pursued it. And the big difference right now in thinking the way in which the Biden people uh, that are in charge of this seem to be leading forward is this real emphasis on alliances and partnerships, that that is our key, uh, that, that our, our alliances and partnerships are our high cards, if you will, in terms of, you know, playing this competitive interaction with the Chinese, not being averse uh, to collaboration when that makes sense for global problems and international issues, but competing as the primary paradigm, confronting when we must. And I think one can see this pretty clearly, Aaron, and I encourage your listeners to take a look if they haven't already, to two items that uh, that came out on March 3rd. So, you know, just barely uh, three weeks ago now. The first was a speech by Secretary of State Blinken called A Foreign Policy for the American People, where Secretary Blinken basically laid out uh, you know, kind of the, the view for foreign policy in the United States, which, you know, emphasized areas for cooperation um, internationally and domestically and revitalization domestically, but also highlighted three critical things. First, the emphasis on rebuilding partnerships with allies and other key partners. Second, 
to secure US leadership in technology and to energize that process. And third, to manage, and he says this, manage the changing relationship with China. And it was after that that he said again this mantra, compete when we should, collaborate when we can, confront when we must. And then later that afternoon, the National Security Council released uh, a document titled the Interim National Security Strategic Guidance. And that document really echoed a heck of a lot of what Secretary of State Blinken said earlier in the morning, noting that a global change in power structures begat the China and Russia challenges. So kind of a formal acknowledgement that the underpinning of the Trump administration national security strategy was now part of the Biden administration's interim national security strategy. And then it goes on to talk about defending US strengths, promoting a favorable global power distribution and leading and sustaining the international systems as key aims for US strategy and US security. So I think what we see here is, you know, after a lot of, you know, um, legitimate questioning about how the Biden team would take and approach this notion of great power competition, would they orphan it? Would they try to, you know, reset it back in a more comfortable period of collaboration during the Obama administration? And what we're finding out is, is no. Uh, what they've kind of done is they've acknowledged the reality of that descriptor, and they've said, we have to live in that environment, uh, but we're not going to be all just about confrontation. No, we're going to compete as a primary paradigm, collaborate where we can, confront where we must, and really build out an alliance and a partnership network that we believe when put together and really reinforced with American leadership, will put China in a position where they must find more ways to collaborate with us because they will not stand well against us and our allies and our partners. So perhaps the final question as we wrap up here, um, do you think this, this is sustainable? You know, one of the things that you hear is, you know, if you're pulled in two different directions, whether it be uh, both China and Russia at the same time, is necessity of leaning heavily on allies. Um, and do you think that there was a totality of buy-in with those allies to properly burden share across these different two countries? Yeah, I think that's a, that's an excellent um, uh, point for us to continue to watch. As we say in a couple different parts of our book, you know, the, the build out of alliances and partnerships, you know, by a great power is never risk free. Great powers can choose wisely or they can choose poorly uh, about who their partners are. And they can also choose wisely or choose poorly about how they, they look to involve those partners in constructive collaborative exercises that uphold you know, values, traditions, institutions, and norms that are dear to those countries while you know, establishing a framework that makes a, a rival country pretty um, certain that there's, there's strength in that solidarity that the rival dare not challenge. Um, and so putting this into practice is going to be an issue. And uh, as you allude to, Aaron, I think there, there will be challenges of burden sharing. You know, is our, is our partner doing enough? Are they stepping up in all these different areas? And, and that, I think, is, is the, the place where American diplomacy is going to have to lead and quite frankly you know where american uh, framing of its future role in the world is, is going to have to um you know uh, take a, a a potentially more humble frame of reference uh, and what i mean by humble is is that you know when you're a country like america is 330 million people and your primary rival into the future is a country of 1.4 billion people um, there are a number of things that that disparity in in just raw numerics make uh, of a concern and, and mean that you know everything from you know the number of consumers you have for products and other things you know the arrival china is going to have more of that you know for the foreseeable future uh, than we individually as a u.s country country will have. But when combined with partners and building out the number of people that are engaged and expanded uh, interactions in economics, you know, in political discourse, in diplomacy, in, 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 in soft power interactions, um, that builds out a number that's as potentially, I should say, as big or greater than what the Chinese have. And, and, and in that there is power, but also in that there has to be this notion of humility in that we need these partners. And so we just can't go and dictate to them what they will do or what they will not do. We need to work with them to see what they feel comfortable in doing or how they can do more and where we can give a little bit where we can acknowledge 
or, or give so that we do not have just our own way, but we rather have something that melds or blends a little bit more like theirs. And I think in that process, first, the United States has an inherent advantage, particularly over China, because while we've done a lot of this uh, throughout the post uh, World War II era, the Chinese have done very little of this. America has a wide network, some would argue, in disrepair recently, but nonetheless a wide network of allies, partners, and friends to call upon and to work with. The Chinese have relatively little experience in this. As a matter of fact, I don't know that we could call China as having, you know, really a strategic partner, much less a friend outside of Pakistan anywhere in the world. I mean, even North Korea is kind of an ephemeral transactional kind of relationship. So there is that advantage. But as I think you allude to here, and as we try to get to in the book, that advantage is only going to be sustainable if the United States is willing to give uh, to allies and partners, as well as to demand from them in order to build a more common and solidified union uh, that can stand the, the test of what certainly, Aaron, is going to be a long-term competition. I mean, this is not going to be, you know, years or even a decade or two, most likely, unless somebody follows this up badly and we wind up in a shooting war, which nobody really wants. This is going to be a long-term competition. And so we're going to have to learn to compete again and compete well. And the alliances and friendships that we have internationally are going to be a very important catalyst to us being able to do that competition well and right. Thomas, it's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. Um, I do encourage everybody to go check out the edited volume or the book. Um, I have it right here in front of me on my computer. And if you look down in the show notes, you'll also be able to find it. Uh, it's Strategic Assessment 2020 into a new era of great power competition. And it is, as advertised, uh, available for free online to download. So with that, thank you for uh, taking the time and joining me this morning. Hey, thank you, Aaron. I enjoyed it a lot. Appreciate and, it. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Chain Reaction. Be sure to subscribe to Chain Reaction on iTunes and Spotify. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at the handle at FPRI. Chain Reaction is a podcast of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank in Philadelphia. For more information about this and other initiatives, be sure to visit www.fpri.org.